I'm Jay Barber III, and I serve as the Chief Consultant of Environmental Justice and Equity here at the Coalition for Green Capital. I'm excited to have you all join us for a conversation on the Greenhouse Gas Reduction Fund and the opportunity to advance environmental justice within a national green bank. This is an important conversation that for scores of people invested in ensuring that our nation meets this moment of climate crisis. Uh, and you will today hear from a dynamic set of speakers who have committed themselves to ensuring that a national green bank meets the challenge of the climate crisis with solutions that advance inclusive prosperity and environmental justice and create a just transition for all. The National Green Bank is part of the complete toolkit of measures in this historic legislation that guarantees a rapid transition from carbon to the clean power platform underlying the entire national economy and launching thousands of businesses making and selling clean products. With $20 billion of capital, the National Green Bank and its network will be the single largest nonprofit institution dedicated to environmental justice for disadvantaged communities in a moment of urgent need. We are excited to be joined by many individuals on today's call to talk about the importance of prioritizing community-based organizations, environmental justice organizations and commitments as we build the moment and the, of our time. So please uh, tune in, engage with us for a quick conversation. Um, we are really excited. This will be recorded, so we will be sharing this out with individuals for further use. Um, but let's go ahead and dive in. Uh, as I've mentioned, I've been working with the Coalition for Green Capital as the Chief Consultant for Environmental Justice and Equity for the better part of a year. And with the team, and like many of you, have recognized that this moment where we have a surge in national demand for clean energy investments able to be deployed by green banks means that we must also deepen our commitments around climate and energy justice. This means that we must continue to advocate and advance energy equity by increasing access to clean technology and workforce opportunities for communities of color and poor and low-income communities. This means that we must be leading in the development of innovative products, financial and physical, that are responsive to the unique needs of these communities and that also further and enhance community participation. It means that here at CGC, we've committed to acknowledging our role at the helm of the National Green Bank Movement and continuing to work with partners to coordinate uh, uh, our efforts, seeking opportunities to maximize co-benefits for communities through combinations of deployed capital and legislative incentives, and to build upon a credible track record to show that creative solutions and innovative new ways of measuring our success have a viable place in the mainstream discourse of climate finance. As each of you all can see, this is an ambitious goal, but it is the moment in which we are in. And we believe we have the right team and the right network to make this a reality. Now, there are a number of ways that we've been working to actually operationalize this. Uh, a few things. Number one, we have scaled up our organizational capacity with the cadre of experts on advancing environmental and climate justice. In addition to my role, in February of 2022, we onboarded CGC's inaugural Environmental Justice Advisory Board. You will hear from these members later, but this board consists of a diverse set of leaders from across the nation who will help increase our capacity to think strategically around the issues of environmental justice, climate justice, and energy justice. Number two, in concert with our Environmental Justice Advisory Board, we have continued refining a theory of change for in green bank engagement that clearly articulates commitments to developing strategies specifically targeted for engagement of LMI and BIPOC communities. Number three, this conversation is a part of a long-term strategy to identify and create outreach opportunities to national partners with proven track records of engaging frontline constituencies. That includes environmental and energy justice advocates and activists. It includes community-based organizations who have deep trusted relationships in frontline communities. It includes reaching out to networks of BIPOC people of color led financial intermediaries who we need to help us deploy capital to the areas that need it most. And we are being creative in this. We are including uh, uh, all of these organizations, but also making sure that we are expanding our imagination to think of who are other allies we need to pull into the table 
as we build this big tent. So with that, we're gonna dive into the conversation. I wanna introduce Eli Hobson, who serves as the CEO uh, of the Coalition for Green Capital to talk a little bit about the urgent need of the Greenhouse Gas Reduction Fund and the potential to see the National Green Bank. Eli previously was CEO of the DC Green Bank where he led the strategic and operational implementation of DC Green Bank's programs and fostered partnerships with key partners and stakeholders. Under his leadership, DC Green Bank developed its first financial offerings, established strategic relationships, and explored opportunities to realize ambitious clean energy goals. A clean energy expert, Eli previously served as Vice President of Legal and Chief Compliance Officer at Eagle Creek Renewable Energy, successor to a merger with Cube Hydro Partners where he was VP of Regular, Regulatory, Legal, and Policy. Eli's prior experiments also includes Latham and Watkins, the Union of Concerned Scientists, the U.S. House of Representatives Committee on Science, and U.S. Department of Energy Office of Energy Efficiency and Renewable Energy. Eli, welcome. Thank you, Will. And thanks everyone for joining us um, on a Sunday afternoon. Really appreciate it. Especially wanna, um, well, thank you for the promotion. I'm just <laughs> also glad to be joined by Reed Hunt, our CEO and uh, chairman of our board. Um, I wanna thank Marla Blow and Sue Tierney, other board members for joining us today. Um, it, it shows the depth of our commitment to environmental justice and energy justice and that we're able to get so many members of our board and other members um, of the consortium on board as well. So as Will mentioned, and, and I um, look forward to kind of chatting in a little bit more detail, but we are committed here at CDC to the dual mission of helping to create a national green bank for the climate imperative, because we need to act swiftly on climate in order to reduce the worst potential impacts that we're seeing, unfortunately, and that several of you who are on this call um, are in Egypt working together to try and help to prevent and to make a difference in disadvantaged communities that too long have been underserved by our financial sectors. And so those dual missions are really a key piece of why I agreed to come to the Coalition for Green Capital. Um, at DC Green Bank, I focused on inclusive prosperity and sustainability and clean economy and how those three missions work together um, to help support our low income communities and those who are bearing the highest energy burden, both from the cost of energy production, but also from the uh, unfortunately all too real pollution impacts of energy production. And so this opportunity that we see uh, together working with all of you to make a real impact with not just the initial public investment of 20 billion under the EPA's Greenhouse Gas Reduction Act, but to leverage that, bring in the additional public funding, bring in the private funding, to over two, 10 years, make a $250 billion investment in sustainability in disadvantaged communities, that could really start to move the needle on climate change. And that's why I'm excited to be here talking with you today. Um, so Bill, if you can move to the next slide, please. Thank you. Um, so as we both talked about, the dual mission is critical here. And in order to get to that $250 billion number, we need to have a scaled, centralized national green bank that can really take advantage of both the public and private opportunities that are out there and the opportunity to immediately leverage on the balance sheet from day one helps to get you started on that path but then also working with key partners who have experience with communities and can invest in projects at a leverage level that starts to get to two to three times the initial investment and then over time because of the standardization allowing us to recycle those funds and get another two to three X, um, getting you towards that $250 billion number over 10 years. Next slide, please. This is just a rough mock-up of the structure of what we're thinking about for a national green bank. Um, we are, as you can see, the, the top line investment comes in from, from EPA and then uh, the several pieces of how this, how this needs to work in order to be most effective. So first, um, an indirect investment through partner institutions, including CDFI loan funds, community banks, and credit unions, the existing green banks, but also uh, new green banks and new financing institutions for communities that are not served by a financial institution that's focused on sustainable investing. Um, unfortunately, many of the regions of the country that are facing 
the most serious challenges in terms of energy pollution um, and have historically been burdened with energy production do not have state or national institutions or sorry, state or regional institutions or local institutions focused on supporting sustainable finance in those communities. So one of the key missions of the National Green Bank is to also make uh, investments in financial assistance, technical assistance to help start up those new institutions where they don't exist or to help build the capacity in existing platforms and existing institutions that do exist to serve those communities. So in addition to the indirect investment, the National Green Bank also needs to make direct project finance investment. So there are projects that are too large or too complicated or um, you know, have a scale that is regional or national. Examples include transmission, which is necessary to be able to reach the scale of zero emission renewable energy uh, that we wanna see in this country. But um, to date is too large of a problem for any of the state or local green banks to handle and, and many of our financial institutions to handle. So a direct investment side needs to be targeting those types of very large regional projects that are not served by existing entities and also helping to establish and support markets across the country uh, where there are not those local institutions that are ready uh, to serve sustainable finance. Another key role of the National Green Bank, you can see on the right side, secondary market development, having a single platform that helps to standardize uh, the types of loans that are being offered, the um, agreement and alignment on underwriting that all the intermediary uh, institutions provide, uh, the, the, um, the depth of um, underwriting expertise and providing tracking, recording, and helping with the reporting requirements that will be a necessary part of both the EPA grants, but also in order to create a consistent loan portfolio that the secondary markets is gonna be interested in, you really need to see national standardization and a single national green bank is a key piece of that. And um, that helps us get to the recycling of funds so that um, after two or three investment from the national green bank directly and through intermediaries, you create a loan pool of sufficient size that it can be recycled. And again, that gets you one of those two to three times um, for turning that public 20 billion into 250 billion. So the secondary market piece is critical. And then finally on the, the left-hand side, seeing the ecosystem development, there's a whole host of um, communication support, transparency and data, compliance and regulatory pieces, policy both at the state, local and national level to support sustainable finance and to support environmental justice, as well as grants for capacity building and grants for innovation and research. So. Uh, a huge portfolio of work that needs to be done. The National Green Bank is a piece of that, but it's only gonna be successful with the help of its partners um, like all of you. Next slide, please. So in terms of what the uh, product suite would be that the National Green Bank is supporting, ultimately looking to do investment in electric heat pumps, electric water heaters, community solar, residential solar, those types of projects that have a clear greenhouse gas benefit and have a clear local air pollution benefit. Um, so looking for that dual mission again, even from the direct investment piece, um, even from the particular investments that we're thinking about. Now there's a wide variety of pieces that we're considering, um, looking to work with a wide variety of partners, as I mentioned, and this is a draft list, but you know, love to be um, working with all of you to think about what are the real opportunities that are gonna be most effective in helping to move the needle on climate and are gonna be most beneficial to the communities that are most impacted by our energy production. Next slide, please. So a little bit of uh, history here. Um, for those of you who, who haven't been tracking um, the work that CGC has been doing over the past several years, in 2009 through 2010, uh, the coalition actually supported a national green bank and it was passed the house with bipartisan support. It's the Clean Energy Deployment Administration. It was the first time it passed the house, but it wouldn't be the last, unfortunately. Um, so we see two more times until finally, um, you know, we got to the IRA. In the meantime, uh, the coalition worked to support state and local green banks, creating the Michigan Green Bank, the New York Green Bank, Connecticut Green Bank, ultimately in a personal favorite supporting the DC Green Bank um, a little bit later. Um, but all of those institutions have gone on to make significant investments in local communities and in sustainable finance and really helping to build the track record that the coalition uh, brings to this work. Uh, next slide, please. So 
so the um, you know exciting part that we're all now talking about is what happens um, when we get over the finish line, the Inflation Reduction Act being passed with the support of the administration and with both houses of Congress, it, it's really building on this history of years of working on a national green bank. Unfortunately, it has to go through the reconciliation process. And so the language gets, uh, the language gets condensed, um, but overall what we see um, and that uh, you all are all aware of and why we're all here today is that the G Greenhouse Gas Reduction Fund uh, came through with a total of 20 billion that includes a mandatory minimum of 40% for environmental justice and that EPA has to act swiftly within 180 days um, and targets this at a eligible recipient, which is an independent 501c3 um, to provide that independent governance and make sure that as you know, political uh, shifts come and go at the agency, that the independent entity that will be the National Green Bank is able to maintain that commitment to sustainable investing in environmental justice over the long term, which is what's needed to be able to make uh, the kind of investments to build that leverage um, to move that 20 billion into uh, the 250. Next slide, please. Um, so the will is, do you wanna do the intros here? Eli, if you have any final comments or, you know, as an overview of that, that big picture vision, please, um, before we introduce two of our esteemed board members. Great, thank you. Um, I think just the, the quick highlight is that um, we're excited to work with all of you here. Um, and, you know, we've assembled a board that has a breadth of experience that we're really excited about um, and look forward to working with you as we're structuring you know, both our comments going into EPA um, on the RFI, but also the application going in over the next few months to help make this um, make this dual mission become a reality. Thanks, Will. Thank you so much, Eli, for that high-level overview of the mission and the urgency of a national green bank in the form of the Greenhouse Gas Reduction Fund. I now want to introduce two of our board members, Marla Blow and Sue Turney, who will talk a little bit about what it takes to build a board with the skills and commitments needed uh, to steer the National Green Bank with that double bottom line of greenhouse gas reduction and uh, community engagement, prioritizing disadvantaged communities. Uh, quick introductions, Marla Blow uh, is president and CEO of the Skoll Foundation. She is also a board member for the Coalition for Green Capital. Uh, she brings deep experience in economic inclusion, uh, serving for years as a corporate ex executive, a federal regulator, an entrepreneur and an angel investor. Uh, throughout her career, she has been unwavering in her commitment to being a purpose-driven leader in both the private and public sectors. Uh, Marla has led efforts to address the racial, uh, the racial wealth gap and opportunity gaps through programmatic work and impact investments in support of Black communities. She is the board chair at Lift DC, an organization that helps low-income parents with young children achieve economic mobility and also serves on the board of Square Financial Services. Dr. Thank you. Oh, sorry. Dr. Sue Turney is an expert on energy policy and economics, specializing in the electric and gas industries. She has consulted companies, governments, and nonprofits, and other organizations on energy markets, as well as economic and environmental regulation and strategy. Her expert witness and business consulting services have involved industry restructuring, market analysis, utility rate making and regulatory policy, as well as clean energy regulatory policy. She's a former assistant secretary for policy at the US Department of Energy, a state cabinet officer for environmental affairs and state public utility commissioner. She chairs the board of directors of resources for the future, as well as Climate Works Foundation and serves on the external advisory board of the National Renewable Energy Laboratory. Marla, Sue, please tell us a little bit about what it will take to build a board with the skills to meet this moment. Well, thank you, Will, and apologies for jumping the gun there. I'm excited to talk about this and to spend some time with you and, and this team uh, and with our audience here today to talk about the importance of this exercise. And for me, the opportunity to engage on something like this where we are operating at the intersection of racial justice, economic inclusion, and environmental energy justice is 
is right down the middle for me and the opportunity to bring together all of the groups that we've talked about, including connectivity to community development, financial institutions and other participants in this space uh, could not be more readily apparent. I think in terms of being able to mobilize and, and meet this moment and build this organization, we've brought together connectivity with the philanthropic sector and the civic engagement arena. We brought private sector actors, as you mentioned, and we have the public sector connection as well. Um, and I bring the philanthropic piece to the table and my in my role at Skoll, where we are actively engaged on exactly the issues that you've outlined here. So with the support and cooperation and continued push from all of us to ensure that by working together, we can go so far in addressing the deeply entrenched problems and challenges and opportunities that we have in front of us to build the society and the energy structure that, that we so, that so meaningfully can count on to, uh, to shift where we are from an environmental perspective. So from my, you know, from, from my end, Will, I guess what I would say is bringing that deep commitment and bringing that level of expertise across a host of dimensions is the difference maker for, for this National Green Bank undertaking knowing that we will be able to speak the language and bring the right, the right to support from across all of the different sectors of our society is the difference here and, and sets us up to be successful in building the organization that we have in front of us. And importantly, I do want to stress that, that my own personal commitment to this, both personally and professionally, starts with the fact that I am deeply invested in building equity into everything that I do and everything that I touch and every place that I that I show up. So I this is not a theory for me. This is not a an initiative. This is a way of life. And I bring that to the table here in, in what we're doing at the National Green Break at the Green Bank. So thank you. I'm excited to be a part of it. Thank you so much, Marla. I uh, really appreciate such a concise, clear-headed vision of where we need to go. And so glad to have you a part of the leadership of this team, this winning team. Uh, Sue, can you please uh, share your thoughts? Thanks, Will. Uh, it's really wonderful to be here and to share this moment with the attendees, but also my colleagues uh, who are involved with the Coalition for Green Capital. Uh, I've been a member of the board for about a year and a half, and I just wanted to share and amplify some of the things that Marla said about the board's views regarding governance of a national green bank with a dual mission of reducing greenhouse gas emissions and air pollution and bringing material, concrete, substantial benefits to disadvantaged communities. In the past, decade, the board of the Coalition for Green Capital was really one that befitted an organization that was designed to shepherd a coalition through a period when uh, we were waiting for Congress to act on seed funding a national green bank and to keep the momentum building to do that and to coordinate the coalition, the growing coalition that existed between and among regional, local uh, green banks and other community financial institutions. So that board really was, uh, was working in the field for many years in a small setting to get us to where we are today. And now we are shifting the board. We're shifting it to be bigger and better fit for purpose for governing a national green bank who will be making decisions on an array of different types of projects that Eli described a few minutes ago. And this will be a multi-billion dollar enterprise to reduce greenhouse gas emissions and air pollution and to bring benefits and prosperity to disadvantaged communities. So to do that, the board has to shift and we are shifting. I'm excited to say that we've recently added three new members. We've added Oswaldo Acosta from the Baltimore DC area who has worked in community development financial institutions. We've, uh, we've happily asked Marla Blow to join us, and you've seen her commitment to these issues. And we have just elected Carlos Corbello to the board, a former congressman, 
from Miami who has committed his own professional work and, uh, and abilities to addressing the climate challenge. So as we look to further evolve the board, we are looking at all aspects of diversity. We are looking at ethnic, racial, gender, geographic, age diversity, just in terms of the people who populate the governance structure. And that group of people has to bring a number of areas of expertise and experience. Experience in finance, of course, because that's the purpose of this bank is to leverage finance. And this is not only traditional finance, but also community development financial uh, chops, as well as experience in uh, green banks in different locales. Additionally, experience in greenhouse gas emission reduction projects, experience in environmental justice and equity, uh, experience in nonprofits and philanthropy, as Marla just said, as well as labor and other capabilities to help guide the institution as it goes forward. So I'm, I'm very honored to be a member of this board. I, I just can't tell you how important I think this work is and how appreciative I am that Congress has given to EPA the job of seed funding a, uh, a national green bank and to get it stood up to do the work that's, uh, that's needed ahead to get the job done. So with that, I'll pass it back to you, William, and thanks very much, everyone, for attending. Thank you so much, Marla. Thank you so much, Sue. Uh, it is always good to hear you all's vision, passion, uh, and commitment to building a winning team, again, to meet the urgency of this moment. Um, as we transition, I do want to acknowledge that we, as you all can see, have a really committed, uh, really busy team uh, that is working diligently to make sure that we get this, this moment right. Uh, with that, I want to acknowledge two of our team members who were hoping they could join us for today's conversation, but have had some logistical challenges uh, and commitments. Actually, I think we have uh, Michael able to call in. I don't think he'll be able to, to join us on video, but he's here to call in. But Michael Jeans, who is the Chief Operating Officer of Growth Opportunity Partners and American Green Bank Consortium member uh, and a true ally in this work. Michael is the founding president and CEO of Growth Opportunity Partners, a small business advisory investment and lending community financial institution. Uh, for small businesses and middle market companies, Growth Ops provides capital, consulting, and advisory ser services to support the growth of companies and the development of management teams. Growth Ops has a particular focus on impact in low and moderate income communities, which is so critical to the conversation we're talking about today. Oswaldo Acosta is the president and CEO of City First Enterprises. He's an American Green Bank Consortium member and a board member for the Coalition for Green Capital. Um, in his work for years, Oswaldo has brought lending, project finance, and entrepreneurial experience to lead efforts in advancing economic development and progressive agendas. He has led the design and implementation of the strategic expansion of CFE activities to new investment categories, including clean energy, small business, and residential mortgage lending. Uh, Michael, are you with us? I'm here. Can you hear me, William? Yes, we can. Great. Okay. Greetings from uh, COP27 in Egypt. I apologize. Our IT team, IT team seems uh, a bit more aggressive than maybe we thought. So uh, they got me back online, and I really wanted to be a part of uh, this conversation, uh, primarily uh, for two reasons. One is uh, this, this is an important topic. The, the conversation around equity and equitable deployment is not only one that's important to me, that's important to uh, our, our BIPOC communities, uh, but, but also to the administration. And uh, in my understanding is that the question is being asked uh, by the president uh, just about every other day. Uh, you know, how can we ensure that this capital will be deployed in an equitable manner that will reach black and brown uh, and, and, and communities of color uh, and communities that need it most? Uh, as William mentioned, I am the uh, I head up Growth Ops, uh, which uh, also 
created the first African American led green bank in the uh, in the country. We we created uh, Go Green uh, Energy Fund in 2020, and that was uh, with the support of, uh, if not the leadership from the coalition from Green Capital. Uh, I'm sorry, coalition uh, for Green Capital. Uh, I I wanted to chime in today just to let you first have a point of contact with me. And secondly, to let you know that the, the whole intent here is uh, to make the, uh, the, 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 the requirement, the interest, the, the necessity for ensuring this capital reaches communities that it typically doesn't reach, uh, to let you know that that's a priority for us. And so you, you may have heard Reed uh, say this, and I, I missed the preamble, Reed, I apologize. You know, the, the intent here is to create a big tent, and 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 the result of that is uh, so that uh, this becomes the solution that is uh, most attractive uh, to fund. Uh, and if and if we're looking at twenty billion dollars uh, being allocated to the consortium, uh, we we have a history of attracting follow-on capital, and I believe the the number is around a, a twelve and a half x uh, in in an additional uh, private. And other capital, so that moves this to 250 billion dollars. That uh, you know, all all in, if you will, or in the aggregate, can go to our communities. Now, that being said, uh, we we have to hold each other honest and and accountable. And so, I don't want to you know sit on this call and and tell you um, uh, I don't want to mislead you. There's, there's there's a lot of work to be done. Uh, there's a lot of leaning in that needs to happen and uh, commitments that need to be made. And so the, the calls and the conversations are the start of that. Um, you know, partnership, you know, comes with trust uh, and, and trust, uh, you know, only is sustained if we do what we say we're going to do. So uh, I know this is a meaty topic. It's, uh, it's a conversation that should be had. And frankly, if we're uh, going to build the big tent, then, you know, for me, the question is, what are the things that we all need to do so that uh, we can find not only a level of comfort, but assurances that these dollars are going to be deployed in an equitable manner. Uh, for us at Growth Ops, uh, I can tell you that, you know, our experiences have been uh, good with the coalition. And frankly, we're having conversations with other black and brown organizations. I'm also a member of the African American Alliance uh, for CDFI CEOs. And so, uh, you know, there is a concerted effort uh, across the country to ensure that these dollars go where they go, where, where they should go. Uh, and, and my role in this is, uh, is, is, is much the same. So uh, I, I, I'll turn the floor back over to you, William, and to the team members. Uh, but I, want, I just want to leave you with, um, there's capacity to do a lot of good here. And one of my concerns is that uh, the deployment becomes so fractured, if you will, uh, sliced in, in so many different ways that uh, we don't get the kind of metrics and outcomes that allow us to, to, uh, to, to get another bite at the apple, if you will. Um, and I don't want to see that happen. Uh, this, this is uh, why I get up in the morning. So uh, if you don't have my contact information, I'm sure we can get out there to you. But this is, this is something we talk about at every meeting. And it's not just because I'm on the, the, uh, the consortium calls. It's because uh, this is an important topic uh, and William has been leading the charge. I think many of you have, have met William uh, at least virtually or by phone uh, because this is important. We don't, we don't wanna miss anyone uh, in any uh, uh, organizations with whom we should be speaking. So I'll pause there. I can only hope that you heard me and, uh, and maybe you, you could see my camera coming uh, coming here from my hotel room and my, my lovely closet door behind me. Um, but let's, let's do what we need to do so that we can access this capital in a meaningful way and, and get the real work done so that we can look back uh, and our kids and our grandkids can look back. And, and when they ask us that question, uh, you know, where were we when this opportunity presented itself? We've got, uh, we, we've got uh, the, the proof in the pudding, if you will, uh, and generations will have benefited from the work that we can all do together. Thank you.
Michael, thank you so much for those comments. Um, and thank you to Oswaldo, knowing that he is joining us uh, uh, in theory and, 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 and has been you know, an ally in this work. One thing that I find really exciting uh, about this conversation is that when we think about the disconnect that has sometimes been created between community-based organizations, environmental energy, climate justice advocate and activists, and individuals on the financing side, the technological deployment side, uh, who are really looking at what are the ways we solve this moment, is that this moment of crisis has actually created, uh, maybe unknowingly, a moment where both of those constituencies are starting to talk the same language, the same language around just transition, the same language around uh, uh, energy equity. And that is really an exciting uh, 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 moment. It speaks to the opportunity that you've heard several uh, individuals on the call uh, talk about. Uh, and it's so critical to getting this moment right uh, and having success in what we are looking to do. Um, I do wanna offer Michael, thank you to my note and an amendment that even in my role, because this work is of such an unprecedented scale, I'm a part of a team, just like each and every one of us have to be a part of a team leading this charge. And so I just wanna offer and echo appreciation to everyone, all of our speakers, as well as transition to acknowledging the contributions of our Environmental Justice and Equity Advisory Board. Um, I introduced uh, this group at the beginning of the call, as I mentioned, We've been working with our inaugural CGC, Environmental Justice and Equity Advisory Board, since February of this year, uh, and they have been absolutely instrumental in pushing us to really think critically about what are the internal commitments around environmental justice, climate justice, energy justice, what are the ways that we think about uh, true benefits for disadvantaged communities, uh, what are the ways that we even think about not only workforce development uh, opportunities, but entrepreneurial and ownership opportunities for communities on the front lines. How do we understand communities, disadvantaged communities, not just as new markets to be exploited or to be customers, but as co-owners and true partners, true partners in building this big tent. And so with that, I wanna introduce two of our uh, Environmental Justice and Equity Advisory Board members, Charlene Brown, who serves as the director of the uh, Initiative on Racial Equity and Economics, Finance and Sustainability at Croatan Institute, uh, as well as Raya Salter, uh, known colloquially as the Climate Auntie, who is also coming to us from COP27, uh, who's the founder of the Energy Justice Collective, a member of the New York State Climate Action Council uh, and a CJC Environmental Justice, Justice Advisory Board member. Um, they will bring us quick comments on what it takes to meet this moment just transition and the importance of having commitments to environmental justice within a national green bank. Charlene, Raya, welcome. Thank you, William. I'm really excited to um, be a part of today's conversation and a part of this work. Um, you know, when I think about this work and certainly in my comments, both internally with my team, but also when I present publicly, I often talk about this really fantastic, interesting um, moment that we have as the United States of America, right? Um, we live in a country where we understand that the um, the racial justice challenges, the challenges related to climate and energy and ecology, that those challenges are often carried on the backs of black and brown communities. But we're also at this point where we actually have to lean in. We have absolutely no choice but to address these challenges because the world calls for us collectively, um, right, globally to do so. Um, and with that moment and this investment through the IRA and the creation of the National Green Bank, I think the opportunity that we have to radically turn around what we see as the um, the racial wealth gap in the United States is what is really also presented here. So I think about it from sort of the energy and the climate piece, but I also see a really powerful opportunity to uplift communities and to create new models that really help to inspire and grow wealth in communities that have historically been left behind. And so that piece of the work, this sort of real big push to look at sort of what are the outcomes of all these investment dollars that will flow into these communities? How do we build the bridges and the pathways to help communities get on and, and create a capacity to actually be a part of this new economy that we have to, again, we have to forge. We have absolutely no choice. 
that feels like the power and the promise. And I am really excited by the effort and the enthusiasm that I see within the CGC team and um, the various advisory boards and, and the board itself and really leaning in to meet this challenge. Um, I think we all know that this work will not be easy, but I think we're really well positioned to actually build a pathway and succeed. Um, and then so five years from now, I really look forward to what we'll be able to say that we've achieved collectively. Um, and so I'm gonna sort of stop there and certainly let Raya jump in because I think she's probably got some amazing comments from where she sits. But um, once again, I'm just really thrilled to be a part of this, of this group and look forward to working with the networks that we built. All right. Thank you. Um, thank you so much for that, Charlene. Um, hello, everyone. I'm pleased to be here with you. I'm also beaming in quite late at night from uh, COP27, and my lighting is not very good, so I'll keep my comments very brief. Um, I think I'll say that, you know, I'm somebody who, you know, I'm a movement lawyer. I've worked with many different climate environmental justice organizations. In New York State, I'm part of our New York State Climate Action Council, and we are writing the plan for how New York will, re will meet our ambitious climate goals. And New York State is the state corollary for this Justice 40 idea. Um, we have in our state law that 40% of the benefits must go to disadvantaged communities. And I have been working for the past two years with the state and with advocates to um, implement this um, this provision of this law. And the reason why I say this is because as much as, you know, as advocates know that, you know, discrimination in the banking sector and things like redlining have done so much to, you know, um, to hurt Black and Brown and Indigenous communities, I have truly seen in this work to um, implement this Justice 40 idea, um, a shift in the way that New York State is doing funding, a shift in the way that um, New York State is approaching environmental energy and climate justice. And this, um, this federal um, opportunity really is unprecedented. This is something that we need. We need all of you to join in with us to take advantage of this unprecedented opportunity to really scale the projects that we want to see done. Um, and um, yeah, I guess that's that. That's really, you know, what I'll say is that we really need um, you, all the listeners, the environmental and climate justice advocates to be partners, to hold us accountable, um, and to be implementation partners so that we can take advantage of what really is an unprecedented um, opportunity. So I'll turn it back to you, Will. Thanks so much, Charlene. Raya, to echo a bit about the work that this advisory board has been engaged in over the nine last uh, nine months, uh, close to a year now, uh, have included two big items, uh, defining and understanding, you know, what is the approach organizationally towards energy, environmental, and climate justice for CGC uh, and, and a national green bank, the American Green Bank Consortium, uh, but also how which and how are the metrics that we hold um, activity accountable to truly creating the benefits for disadvantaged and underserved communities that, that are said. And uh, I am so thankful for you all's commitment, wisdom, hard conversations uh, in making sure that that comes through. We now are going to continue this uh, prong of the conversation, really talking about the urgency of capitalization of a national green bank for frontline communities with a quick clip from Dr. Robert Bullard, who is known as the father of environmental justice. Many of you all know he's the founder of the Bullard Center for Environmental uh, and Climate Justice at Texas Southern University, uh, a member of the White House Environmental Justice Advisory Council, and has been a tireless advocate, a tireless advocate for frontline communities uh, across the nation, uh, making sure that the fight for environmental justice uh, stays strong. So well, well, first of all, uh, thanks for uh, inviting me to uh, to speak on a very important topic. Uh, when we uh, talk about the uh, issue of uh, transitioning to a clean, uh, green, uh, healthy uh, economy uh, that that will use uh, that transition to not only uh, deal with climate uh, crisis but also uh, deal with issues around economic justice. 
and racial justice. So when we uh, uh, talk about the urgency of climate change, uh, we also uh, can uh, basically pull into those uh, solutions uh, the commonality and the, the connectedness of of issues around uh, environmental neglect, that is legacy pollution, that historically uh, from oil and gas, uh, fossil fuel uh, industry that oftentimes disproportionately located in our communities. We can we can talk about the urgency of of uh, reducing the emissions, cleaning up the communities, uh, uh, providing economic opportunity in terms of jobs, economic development, businesses. And so we can see uh, the the issues and the goals uh, around uh, environmental justice will bring together uh, economic, uh, environmental, health, climate, and and livability. Now that's how I see the urgency of uh, getting it right this time. Uh, we may never get the opportunity for policy changes and allowing resource to follow need and policy areas that have historically been neglected. And so this opportunity, as I said before, when we talk about Green Bank, we talk about uh, investments in uh, communities that have long been neglected uh, and, and addressing those issues with the urgency of now. We need uh, this uh, policy uh, to roll out uh, now because communities are, are are hurting now. Uh, communities of color and low-income communities uh, have suffered too long. And we talk about climate change as, as an accelerator. Uh, we need an accelerator in terms of solutions. And I see you know, the idea, the concept, and uh, moving forward with, uh, with this whole concept of Green Bank uh, and a national Green Bank. That's important that we emphasize the national because it's not enough just to have you know, a half, uh, uh, two dozen states moving forward. We need a national uh, accelerator that can implement uh, the, is the issues uh, uh, around climate justice uh, that's fair, just, and equitable. We need that now. I, I direct uh, the environmental, uh, the Bulletin for Environmental and Climate Justice at Texas Southern University. And what we have tried to do uh, at our center uh, is to really look at uh, how uh, the different pieces connect. I've written 18 books deal with housing, transportation, uh, uh, issues around disaster, uh, issues around pollution, industrial uh, facility siting, uh, and, 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 and the issues around uh, building just sustainable and healthy communities. So looking at, looking at the issue holistically, what we have found is that communities right now uh, have uh, priorities that they can uh, look to to say, what are their priorities and what are the needs? So what we have tried to do at our center uh, and working in collaboration with other community-based organizations and other historically black colleges and universities is, race, is, is basically to speak to the issue of, of how can we uh, develop the infrastructure, the social infrastructure, the social network, uh, the collaborations that are strong enough to uh, be to be able to uh, receive uh, funding to develop plans uh, to to de develop uh, collaborations and partnerships so that the the energy around the communities drive to get justice environmental climate economic energy health uh, justice uh, that energy is driven by the priorities of communities, and so that a national uh, green bank would serve the purpose of of identifying uh, where areas are ready uh, to uh, work on these issues. We know all communities across the country are not at the same level of capacity to address these issues, and so having uh, um, organizations and institutions that can provide technical assistance and support to those communities that can get them. Uh, in the position of accessing uh, the resources that are available from the federal government, from Green Bank, from uh, the uh, Inflation Reduction Act, other opportunities 
from the Justice 40 initiative, uh, as well as the, uh, the, uh, the bipartisan infrastructure law. When we talk about resources, we're talking about lots of money. And what we have to make sure is that the money follows need, not money following money, money following power. Historically, that oftentimes will leave behind those communities that need resources most. So what we see, uh, the Green Bank, the National Green Bank, and working with, uh, with uh, state green banks where they are available, where they, are, where they exist, and we know that, that all states are not created equal. There are some states that have them and some states don't. And what we have to do is to try to ensure that no communities are left behind. Uh, that, that we basically ensure that, uh, that energy justice is not just a slogan, it's a reality that's combined with environmental justice and economic justice. We see this as an opportunity, we see it as investments in the future, and we, we see it as making us a, a much stronger, resilient nation that's competitive, where communities are healthy, uh, and that communities uh, are livable, and sustainable. This climate crisis uh, will call for the urgency of us getting it right and right now. So very, very powerful words from our friend and ally, Dr. Robert Bullard in articulating the urgency of getting this right, getting getting the capitalization of a national green bank right and making sure that it is responsive to the needs of frontline disadvantaged communities. Um, so we will now transition back to Eli Hobson to bring us brief comments on and thoughts on how taking into account everything that has been discussed today, how do we actually build the big tent um, and that will be followed by comments from Reed Hunt, uh, CEO of the Coalition for Green Capital, to continue to articulate his vision on moving forward towards capitalization and building the winning team. Eli, Reed. Thank you, Will. Um, it, I think it's important to start, and, and it's a hard, hard act to follow, but uh, important to start with the history. And the Green Bank movement has had a strong track record of working with uh, community lenders, CDFIs, credit unions, other community-focused partners. Um, and so that's been a core piece of the work that Green Banks have done. You know, speaking personally, most familiar with my work at DC Green Bank, mm -hmm. um, we relied on multiple CDFI partners to help us reach particular segments of the small business community, to help us focus on smaller loan sizes, and to help um, rely on their expertise in community lending, underwriting, uh, servicing, et cetera. So several partnerships there that um, were very successful for both DC Green Bank and our CDFI partners. And we're excited to bring that model more broadly. Um, it's one that's been replicated across the Green Bank uh, infrastructure, multiple examples of partnerships with CDFIs on sustainable finance. The strengths that we each bring to this are, are synergistic. Uh, the experience that the green banks have in sustainable investing, the focus on the new um, opportunities that the IRA is bringing in terms of tax credits, uh, rebates, uh, additional funding sources, et cetera, as well as the focus on sourcing additional private capital for investment in these sustainable finance projects within communities, um, coupled with the CDFI and other community lender, extensive outreach network, extensive experience in underwriting, and um, extensive infrastructure um, that's in place and existing that in order to meet the very aggressive goals that we have laid out in order to put 250 billion to work in our disadvantaged communities across the country, uh, we will need uh, all of the partnerships um, that we can get and all of the folks who are interested in making a difference, making this transition a true just transition. Uh, we wanna work with, with each and every one of you. So the the details um, you know, are still in process at EPA, um, but the one uh, point that, that I wanna raise here before I hand it over to Reed is that we all know that time is of the essence, particularly for climate. Um, and I thank you to Raya and thank you to Michael Jeans and, and, and Dr. Bullard and the others who are at COP um, working to make this um, 
you know, as quick of a process as we can, but we all have to work together to help EPA and the other actors here make sure that we can put this money to work as quickly as we can. And for that, we need strong partnerships and, and looking forward to working with all of you. And Reed, I'll hand it over to you. I have to say that I've uh, never been more uplifted, uh, never been more confident, never uh, been more excited about our prospects uh, to, to make this change and to have it be that uh, that, that, that we, that at the most fundamental level, you know, alter the physical, social, and, and equitable landscape of America. And when I say that I've never been more confident, uh, let me just speak personally. I've been involved in the battle against catastrophic climate change for 30 years. It was the summer of 1992 that my ninth grade classmate, Nal Gore, and I were at the first Earth Summit in Rio when um, when Bill Clinton called him up and said, maybe you'd like to come back and be interviewed to be the vice president. And 14 years ago, uh, President-elect Obama asked me to join his, uh, his transition team, which convened uh, 14 years ago this, this week. I had been helping him for the previous five years, uh, starting in his race uh, to get the Democratic nomination for Senate. And in that transition team uh, process, I and a number of others asked that a national green bank be created as part of the stimulus plan. And we were told by the economists that clean power was too expensive, uh, that low income families couldn't afford uh, the different components of the clean power platform, and that the government couldn't afford to help them be able to afford these products. So our idea was rejected and we did not take no for an answer and we created this nonprofit, the Coalition for Green Capital and we found Sen Congressman Van Holland, later Senator, Congressman Markey, later Senator, uh, Congressman John Dingle, who passed and his wife Debbie took up the flag and a number of other people on the Hill and for well, all the years since then, at the state level, uh, more than 20 states. Uh, Michael Jean is an example of the kind of person that we found as a self-starting entrepreneur, put the green flag down in a difficult state. And we built this movement, hundreds and hundreds of people built this movement over the 14 years. In the year 2019, for the first time in American history, legislation was drafted that established a specific amount of money dedicated by Congress to environmental justice, a specific amount of money for the very first time ever. Uh, there was a lot of horse trading in Congress, so the number picked was 40% times 20 billion, or in other words, 8 billion. You heard from Raya that 40% was the going rate at that time because New York had adopted a 40% number. Um, that 40% now has been translated through the reconciliation process to an $8 billion fund it, that the EPA has to award, and that leaves another 12 billion. So there's two different funds. And here's what I wanna make sure that, that, that everybody in the country come to, to understand. Um, that 12 plus that eight is 20. All that 20, if it is put into the National Green Bank, is not going to end up with just $8 billion dedicated to low-income communities. That is not our pledge. Our pledge is that we have learned over the course of all these years, through all these different green banks and through the expertise of so many people, we have learned that if we can have all that $20 billion, we pledge that $250 billion that's the number you heard from Eli at the beginning of this, that $250 billion will be invested in and for low-income communities in, of America. That's our pledge. And it is not just slideware. We have lived it, we have breathed it, we have proved it over the course of 10 years of this Green Bank movement. And what we need now is a collective effort to let us, and this is what Michael was talking about earlier, to let us put up a big, big, tall pole in that big green tent 
so that there are plenty of seats under that tent for every nonprofit, every nonprofit that doesn't even now exist, but that might come to exist, every CDFI, every CDCU, every CD, whatever, to come in under that tent, become the beneficiaries of all that money, and then transform America where it actually has to happen, which is house by house, building by building, small business by small business, in all the communities of America, but not starting with the rich, starting with the great mass of America who have been year after year after year unattended to by legislation, except now. This is the first time in the history of any country in the world where there's been a federal commitment to create a national green bank that would be dedicated to uplifting, transforming, and changing the low income communities of any country. This is the first time ever. Now, we, now they're talking about this in Egypt and talking about how the developed countries need to uh, help the developing countries. We need to live the same dream here at home and pull everybody to the same level. And I'll just in conclusion say that the E of emissions and the E of equity, it's the same problem where the emissions are coming from. You drive around rich neighborhoods, you do not see a coal-fired boiler in those neighborhoods, you do not see an industrial plant. Where you find the emissions coming from, spewing out of smokestacks, polluting the air, poisoning the water, harming the children, and locking people into low-wage jobs, where you find that that's the problem that has to be solved by a clean power platform, that's the same community that we have to change for the better by giving them new jobs, installing those solar panels and the chargers for the electric trucks and all the different piece parts of the clean power platform. Solving the problem of equity and solving the problem of emissions is the same problem. And that's what we're dedicated to solving. Eli Reed, thank you so much for those uh, closing comments. Um, and thank you all to the attendees, to the panelists, the speakers, to everyone who has committed to being a part of this Big Tent, this team thus far. Uh, thank you, sincere thank you. Um, we are gonna dive into three quick uh, questions uh, just to kind of round out the discussion and then return you all to your Sunday evening. Um, but the first question I wanna go into, uh, we have a lot of individuals with financial business, entrepreneurial backgrounds here on the call that understand the tech technicalities of capital structures and things like that financial financial deals we've heard this notion and we've discussed um many of you and i have discussed this this notion of there being not just the 20 billion dollar capitalization but a 12 times uh uh increase actually premium on top of that for what that actual investment could be Reed, Eli, Sue, Marla, would either of you like to talk a little bit about this notion of financial leverage and how we could actually get to that many times over investment into frontline communities? I think we should let the youngest person answer that question because that because it's the 10 years of his career that will be dedicated to doing it. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Reed. Um, ha happy to do so. Um, so the, the first step of the, the leverage equation is that um, with a 20 billion, you know, or similar scale investment um, of cash, you're able to balance sheet leverage that at somewhere above um, double. So you take that 20 billion, you turn it into 40 billion immediately. Um, and all of a sudden, you know, that minimum eight turns into 16 billion of investment and the remaining 12 turns into 24. So that's the, the first step. The second step, and this is one that, um, you know, Michael spoke about is one that green banks have traditionally um, done and, and done very well, which is to deploy those into projects alongside private investment. So typically that's, uh, you know, something like, uh, two to three times factor of money going into the projects. So the, the national bank or its intermediaries make a portion of the investment and the private sector provides the rest with the national investment coming to support the, the piece that um, you know traditionally seen as riskier or maybe in technologies that commercial banks are less familiar with or maybe in communities 
um, and for particular borrowers that don't meet the traditional credit uh, rating system that's been established by our financial institutions. And so those are um, key strategies for green banks to be able to, to bring in additional private capital and to support the disadvantaged communities that we're targeting. And then the last piece, which, which I talked about a little bit, but is a, I think is another critical one, is that by deploying with standardized loan products, so documentation that's similar into uh, green goods that are similar, like heat pumps, like uh, solar panels, and um, you know, with credit processes, with underwriting that's consistent across the nation, with reporting that's consistent across the nation, then you can have a portfolio that can be rolled up um, and put it into the secondary market. Therefore, you recycle that money. So the first, you know, 200, 300 million of solar loans that goes out the door, once those are bundled up into a financial product, we can sell that, those portfolios and then reinvest another 200, 300 million dollars. And that gets you another three times um, replacement. So that's 40 billion into 120 billion of projects, which then gets recycled over the 10 years, two or three times, and that gets you to the 250 billion. Thank you so much for that. Question number two, um, and this is for anyone, but I especially want to see if uh, Michael, Marla, Charlene may have intentional thoughts here. When we think about disadvantaged communities, do you all have thoughts, initial comments on the importance of pulling out, again, not just viewing these communities as nascent markets and new customer bases, but as potential partners co-owners, uh, how do we build that infrastructure and any initial thoughts there when we talk about the activity around the National Green Bank? Yep, I'm happy to I'm happy to start and talk about some of the ways I've done that myself in my professional pursuits prior to this and and that I bring to the table in helping build this organization. And that includes looking at potential partners, looking at suppliers, looking at execution and analytics on the financing structuring side, that all of those opportunities are, are broadly defined as part of the consideration set for what we're doing here. So this is you know, one of the things that is of paramount importance to me is that this not be seen as an opportunity to to provide more kind of charitable relief or create more, more recipients of, of, um, of funding and instead create knowledge, right? And create muscle that communities can then use and flex on their own without needing the, you know, without needing this kind of, of outside support, but instead building some of that into the communities. So that means a deliberate lens on all of our activities associated with sourcing, with purchasing, with, with partnerships, and that will incorporate the consideration of who is in the leadership positions, who is leading the organizations that are helping us drive this through to completion, and who's bringing this to market, uh, and ensuring that that is equitably distributed and that the definitions and criteria are set in such a way that we both enable that participation and create that capacity where it might otherwise uh, be lacking. So that, and and I should say, this is, again, not a theory for me, right? This is how I lead the Skoll Foundation on a day-to-day -day basis today. And it is how I led as an entrepreneur when I built a company in the financial services arena. Uh, and it is how I've influenced as a corporate executive prior to that. So this is, my my track record on this is uh, is front and center. I just want to plus one all that Marla just outlined is sort of about the ecosystem. I will say that there's a large body of work and research that shows that entrepreneurship is one of the key paths to actually building wealth. Um, and there has been um, academics, and I used to have um, a advisory board member who actually really focused on this area and looked at um, the number and creations of BIPOC um, Black and Brown businesses, and that those numbers tend to be a lot lower than our white counterparts. Um, but at the same time, they, these businesses have offered um, communities the opportunity to really rise in a way that I think, you know, uh, sort of the, the labored positions um, may not have, right? We know that discrimination shows up in a lot of ways, uh, particularly in labor markets. Um, and certainly, I think in my own family's narrative, I would say that um, 
entrepreneurship, starting a small business has been how the family has largely risen. And so that feels really promising. Um, the Kaufman Foundation, uh, circa the events of 2020, um, actually relaunched and really um, began to focus very explicitly on how to build entrepreneurs of color. Um, this is happening in the VC and the PE world. Um, there's a lot of it that's overlapping with technology and climate and climate related issues. So for me, that promise um, feels like it's one particular way to actually uplift communities. But there's also something else that I see emerging, which is sort of different business models, right? Business models that not only enable you know, one or two founders to get wealthy, but to think about ways that we can create employee bases that really support employees to sort of rise up um, on the wealth ladder. So one of the reasons why I think I have really underscored this particular point is because I see that as sort of the fastest bridge to actually transitioning and moving those wealth gap numbers that we see in the United States. The entrepreneurship model seems to be really key in that journey. William, great question. And, and I uh, really appreciate the responses both uh, from, uh, from Marla and from Charlene. Uh, I'll, I'll just add that, um, you know, this language of disadvantaged communities just essentially, uh, you know, captures that these communities have not received the investment that they're due. And when you when you extract investment, uh, there, are, there are consequences to that. And, and these communities that too often are black and brown communities have uh, have borne the brunt of that. Uh, this country will not achieve its macro goals until it until it settles this issue. And this isn't an economic settlement. This is an investment of dollars uh, that, that will be required for there to be true economic growth in the aggregate. So how does that happen? You know, I see two paths. This conversation around the National Green Bank and, and accessing capital and, and, and then the construct of green banks, it's, it's frankly a mechanism. It's, it's a mechanism uh, you know, to, 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 uh, to align capital. But at the end of the day, we've got to find the folks who know these communities, who are not strangers to these communities. These are, I say these communities, this is my community I'm speaking of, right? So it's, it's, it's personal to me. Uh, and so if we're just introducing ourselves to these communities, then that's not, that's not how we're going to foster partnership. It's not how we're going to have clarity on what's needed. Uh, and so uh, that can be uh, 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 acquired by the by some of the green banks who have that background, but frankly, we're going to need to work with uh, with organizations that have been on the ground in communities where we may not have those relationships. If we try to do this all on our own as green banks, we will miss the mark. So I view the green banks as a mechanism, but the other vertical here is uh, who's on the ground who can get to this community in a meaningful way and how do we work together to, to, to enable this capital to do what it's designed to do. And I love the comment of, but this isn't benevolence or charity. This, it, it's, it's, it's overdue investment in these communities. And so when, when you've been disinvested in for as long as, as my communities have been, then it takes an aggressive reinvestment, not at par, but an over allocation. And, and so we've got to ensure that that happens. We'll miss the mark if we think we've got all the answers. If I could just maybe add very quickly to Michael's comment, I think that that's, that's really hitting the nail on the head. I frequently talk about the demographic shift that's happening in the United States. And I do absolutely agree that if we don't actually make the investment now, our ability to lead as a nation, I think is in question. So we've got to do it, even if it's simply for just the economics of it, um, as a nation that wants to continue to lead. William, I, I know that you encouraged Michael, Charlene, and Marla to comment on this point, but would you mind if I just added two cents? Not at all. Please, please. One of the reasons why I am attracted to this idea of the National Green Bank is that it has the scale to leverage investments that are targeted toward disadvantaged communities where there has been the greatest hardships and do the kinds of uh, uh, proactive partnerships that my colleagues have just described now and use resources that are uh, where there may be relatively 
traditionally attractive lending opportunities to create this uh, momentum of further dollars that then can be plowed into uh, investment opportunities and wealth creation in these disadvantaged communities. That's harder to do with really small scale standalone uh, lending opportunities, but the scale of the National Green Bank can really uh, leverage the larger whole for the benefit of these most disadvantaged groups. Thank you so much, Sue, for those words. Um, and a third uh, just quick thought is I think that really speaks to the the quote, what is it that, you know, in the midst of uh, uh, difficulty actually lies opportunity. And though although we are in the midst of an unprecedented challenge, uh, what that also creates is this unprecedented opportunity uh, to get things right, to build a team, uh, a, a really robust team, as all of you all have witnessed today, um, and to just meet this moment uh, in a way that not only addresses the concern and urgency of the climate crisis, but secures a sustainable future, sustainable energy future, environmental future, but economic future for generations to come. Um, so with that, we'll ask the third uh, and final question, which is not really a question, is more so just a quick opportunity for any closing comments from folks on this call. Thank you all so much. We are so, uh, I can say I am so inspired to be working on this team and so appreciate you all's time today. Thank you to the attendees for joining us. Uh, again, this conversation is being recorded. We are planning to share this out as a resource as we continue to build the team, build this big tent. Please, please, please look up Coalition for Green Capital, the work that is being done around the National Green Bank. Uh, and if you are interested in joining, joining this winning team, uh, please reach out to us. Thank you all.